have titled our message today, The Faith of a Prostitute. Joshua chapter 2, The Faith of a Prostitute. Now this chapter, Joshua chapter 2, is probably one of the best known stories, Bible stories, out there. Not only does it tell of a secret reconnaissance mission to Jericho by a pair of young spies, but also introduces us to one of the Bible's most famous characters, character, the prostitute Rahab. Now the story will briefly shift the focus from Joshua and Israel to Rahab and the Canaanites, and also the events that unfolded during a three-day period. Now, if you're familiar with Hebrews chapter 11, only two women are personally named in the hall of fame of faith. Sarah, the wife of Abraham, and Rahab, the harlot of Jericho. Sarah was a godly woman, the wife of the founder of the Hebrew race, and God used her used her dedicated body to bring Isaac into the world. But Rahab was a totally different story, was an ungodly Gentile who worshipped pagan gods and sold her body for money. So humanly speaking, Sarah and Rahab really had nothing in common. But from a divine viewpoint, Sarah and Rahab shared the most important thing in life. They both had exercised saving faith in the true and living God. Not only does the Bible associate Rahab with Sarah, but in James chapter 2 verses 21 through 26, it also associates her with Abraham. James used both Abraham and Rahab to illustrate the fact that what illustrate the fact that true saving faith always proves itself by good works. But there's more. The Bible associates Rahab with the Messiah. When you read the genealogy of our Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 1, you will find Rahab's name listed there. Now, I don't know about you, but when you consider the fact of who Rahab was and how far she came, how far, uh, you know, how far her life went and what happened, I'm, I'm just blown away that a former pagan prostitute became a descendant, an ancestor, of the Messiah. Now, yes, although I find it mind-blowing, it actually doesn't surprise me. Why is that? Because of what it says in Romans chapter 5, verse 20. But where sin is multiplied, grace multiplied even more. But as we go through this story, here's what I want you to Keep in mind, the most important thing about Rahab, the most important thing about this woman was her faith. See, not everything that is called faith is really true faith. See, the difference between faith and true faith is application. True faith, according to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. So in this chapter, we're going to see both Joshua in the beginning and and Rahab displaying true faith for Joshua moving forward, regardless of the obstacles, and for Rahab testing, no, trusting not testing, trusting that God would do what he promised he'd do, deliver the land to Israel. 
Now, overall, just in general, I hope this message shows you this. will show you that Christ, who redeems through the power of the Spirit of God, uses unlikely people, un unlikely persons to proclaim the message of the cross for the salvation of sinners, allowing all believers to serve together in the kingdom of God. So before I begin the first reading, our first section of this chapter, let's pray and ask the Lord to, to speak to us through his word. Thank you, God. You brought everyone here and that everyone is... Um, willing just right now and open to, to just hear what you have to say through your living word. We hope that it, and pray, Lord, that it, it goes out and it does what it's intended to do. And that's just, again, change lives, to plant seeds, Lord, to, to bring people to the cross. pray that you will use me as your vessel, your instrument to share the truth, to proclaim loudly things that you helped me to, to prepare for this morning's message. Pray for those that are watching and listening to this, whether it's live or later on, that you will also move powerfully. You will just restore relationships, and it will change lives as well. So fill this room with your spirit, and speak to us now as we sit at your feet. Pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Joshua chapter 2, verse 1. The Word of God says, Joshua, son of Nun, secretly sent two men as spies from the Acacia Grove, saying, Go and scout the land, especially Jericho. So they left and they came to the house of a prostitute named Rahab and stayed there. The king of Jericho was told, Look, some of the Israeli men, Israelite men have come here tonight to investigate the land. Then the king of Jericho sent word to Rahab and said, Bring out the men who came to you and entered into your house. For they came to investigate the entire land. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. So she said, yes, the men did come to see me, but they did not know where they were from. At nightfall, when the city gate was about to close, the men went out, and I don't know where they're going. Chase after them quickly, and you can catch up with them. But she had taken them up, to the roof and hidden them among the stalks, the stalks of flax that she had arranged on the roof. The men pursued them all along the road to the fords of the Jordan, and as soon as they left, and as soon as they left to pursue them, the city gate was shut. Now. Uh, Upon reading that first part of verse 1, some of you may be wondering why Joshua sent the spies. Was this really necessary if he truly trusted in the Lord? After all, hadn't God promised Joshua that he would give him success? Why didn't he just go ahead knowing that God would somehow supply? After all, the battle is the Lord's, isn't it? These are good questions if you've been thinking them. But here's the thing. Joshua had the precedent of leadership and example of Moses for his action, which was the result of God's own command in Numbers chapter 13. Furthermore, by application, Joshua was, in fact, living and acting on the precepts of Scripture as he was commanded back in chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. Now, while Joshua had the promise of God's deliverance, 
he hadn't been given instruction on just how God was, would defeat the enemies that they would be facing. As a wise military leader, he was simply gathering information. Information on the land, the troops, the resources, their morale. Just trying to get as much information as he possibly can. Important factors that would be necessary for uh, a military campaign. Moreover, he wasn't, he wasn't to presume on the Lord. He was to trust the Lord implicitly. But in that trust, he was also to use the resources God had given him. The training, the men, and the wisdom he had gained. Now just here, in what we've seen, there's uh, a couple of principles found here that I want to mention before I move on to explaining some of the other passage, some of the other passages. First of all, faith in the Lord, faith in the Lord's provision should never lead to presuming on God's decrees or sovereign actions or, in, or our intuitive feelings or on our wants and desires. Faith, you see, faith looks for the principles of Scripture that might be applicable, gathers information or the facts needed to make wise decisions, and then, based on biblical principles and the facts known, moves ahead, trusting in the provision and direction of the Lord. Now, if the Lord wants to intervene in some miraculous way as he did with Jericho, that's great, that's amazing, that's wonderful. But we should never presume on his sovereign ways. But why the secrecy? Why the secrecy? Obviously the spies were to go into the land secretly as spies do. Well, here the reference to secrecy has to do with the people of Israel. He did not want to inform them that he was sending the spies. Nehemiah did similarly when he surveyed Jerusalem. Joshua was acting on behalf of God's purposes and on the people's best interests. He probably remembered that evil report of the spies of the preceding generation and the way this disheartened the people. You see, my friends, people are people, and he didn't want them to unnecessarily get their eyes on the problem. And the second principle is this. Sometimes it's wise for the leaders to do what is needed to keep the eyes of the people on the Lord and his promises rather than on the problems. The need is to encourage one another. See, we sometimes have to face problems. But we must learn to do so through the eyes of faith in God, in God's person, promises, principles, and purposes. This was a matter of discretion and God's leading through studying and knowing what is best in this particular situation. Sometimes it's good to call, every, call to everyone's attention to the problems, but other times it's not. A note, the text that, uh, there says, especially Jericho, which shows us that Joshua was particularly interested in that city. Now, why is that? Jericho lay just five miles from the other side of the, Jordan, of the Jordan and was one of the most formidable fortresses of the land during that time. Conquering this city would not only give them a strong foothold into the land, but conquering Jericho would literally split the forces of the Canaanites 
by coming into Canaan in the middle, hindering their communication and their supply lines. This would have further demoralized, there would have been, this would have been a demoralizing effect on the rest of the inhabitants. Now, in case you're wondering how the two spies made their way through the city without being immediately recognized as strangers, or even how they met Rahab, truth is we're not specifically told how that happened. Now, there are a lot of assumptions out there, some good, some not so good. But again, we're not really told. It's a real possibility that the providence of God led the men there and also brought them all together. Now, the entire story, entire chapter 2, alludes that Rahab had heard of the marvelous victories which the Lord, or she did hear of the marvelous victories which the Lord had given to the Jewish people. That being the case, she would have concluded that their God, the Israeli God, the God of, above all other gods, must be the true God. And so she trusted in him, becoming a true convert. Thus, Rahab was the only person in Jericho who trusted in the God of Israel. And then she proved the reality of her faith by protecting the two spies that represented God's people. She also did this knowing full well that she was betraying her country. You see, had the king found out, he would have killed her on the spot immediately for being a traitor. Now here's another argument or something in things people say or question a question they have. Some will argue that since Rahab was a believer at that time, was it unethical for her to, to lie? Because she did. She misled this, these, you know, the, the Jericho Police Department, we'll call them, JPD. She misled them. So how do we defend her lies? Well, we have to be careful not to put our own ethical expectations on someone who may be new to the faith. Think about that time when you first became a Christian. You made a lot of mistakes. I know I did. You know. But it wasn't until someone brought us in, started discipling us, started teaching us, showing us, we started going to church more, having conversations and and reading our Bible more, that we came wiser and started understanding more about certain behaviors that we need to, we just need to get rid of. So again, we shouldn't be, as a, as a more mature believer, we shouldn't be so quick to put on our ethical expectations on someone that's a new believer. See, more than likely, she... She probably did. She probably knew about the salvation of God. But probably didn't know enough about the practical things in life. If seasoned believers like Abraham and Isaac resorted to deception, as well as David, it better not be too hard then on, on Rahab. And this isn't to excuse or encourage lying, but simply to take her circumstances and into consideration, or will be too quick to condemn her too severely. But I just want to be clear. I want to make sure there is no ambigu ambiguity in what I'm saying. Lying is wrong. Proverbs 12:22 20, says so. The Word of God says so. And the fact that God had Rahab's lies recorded in Scripture, now it is in proof that He approved them. However, 
let's confess that most of us would hesitate to tell the truth if it really were a matter of life and death. It's one thing for me to tell the truth about myself and to suffer for it. But do I have the right to cause the death of others? Especially those who have come under my roof for protection. Now, I want you to also notice another thing here in the beginning of these verses. The designation that she's given. A prostitute named Rahab. Now, one would think that this dubious designation would be dropped once the reader crosses from the Old Testament into the New Testament. However, not only does Hebrews chapter 11, verse 31, call her that, call her a prostitute named Rahab, but James does too. In James chapter 2, verse 25, writing, in the same way, wasn't Rahab the prostitute also justified by works in receiving the messengers and sending them out by a different route? So Rahab is referred to as a prostitute both under the law in the Old Testament and under grace in the New Testament. Make sure I said that right. Uh, she's referred to as a prostitute both under the law in the Old Testament and under grace in the New Testament. But even today, folks, even today we often characterize people by what they were rather than by who they are and by what they've done rather by what they're doing. And listen to this. God is more interested in our present than our past. God is more interested in where you're going than where you've been. God is more interested in who you are than who you were. When it comes to discussing Scripture, though, we associate a person with their inescapable past give you just a few examples, and there's many. The name Jacob, name of my son, it means trickster, supplanter, or deceiver. But when he wrestled with the divine presence, God changed his name to Israel, which means he struggled with God. Yet, we still call him by his own name, Jacob. Remember Thomas? Thomas, who was willing to go to Jerusalem and die with Christ if necessary. Can't ex he can't escape the dubious designation of doubting Thomas. Remember Zacchaeus? He was a publican or a, a tax collector. He was unscrupulous and dishonest. He was a traitor to his people and was despised by the Jews. However, when Christ ate at his home and changed his life, he was called son of Abraham by Jesus. Yet we still know him today as Zacchaeus, the tax collector. And there's many more examples found throughout the scripture, throughout the Bible, the stories in the Bible. And my, but my point is this. All of us, every single one of us, are ex-offenders, ex-offenders of the law of God. All of us have come short of the grace of God. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Yet God has canceled out the penalty of our yesterdays and declared us innocent today so that we might live with him for all of eternity. Whatever dubious designations we hold, if you have 
a dubious nickname because of something you did in the past. Whatever it may be, they don't, not, they, they don't need to be erased because they speak of the glory of our redemption. Church, my fellow believer, where his chil- we are his children, former prostitutes, alcoholics, liars, thieves, murderers, We redeem, we're redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. This is why John Newton, the ex-slave trader, could write the hymn Amazing Grace. He recognized that he was, that he was a once-was individual who was redeemed, as are all believers in Christ the Redeemer. Christ, who redeems through the power of the Spirit of God, uses unlikely persons to proclaim the message of the cross for the salvation of sinners, allowing all believers to serve together in the kingdom of God. Let me also mention this. As believers, as a church, we need to exercise great patience with one another. Christ has called us to be fishers of people. This is something that I, you've heard me say up here before and something that I've talked to the leaders of this church about. Again, Christ has called us to be fishers of people. However, When young people or eccentric people come into our churches with clothing or a look that we may not approve, with hairstyles we may not find desirable, and maybe with the tongue of a sailor, we often try to clean the fish before we catch the fish. Friends, we're told... We're not told to be cleaners of fish, but what? Catchers of fish. Our task is to catch them with the gospel net and let the Lord clean the fish once they're his. The Lord will clean up their language and will teach them to dress modestly as well as to carry themselves in the Christ-like manner. Rahab, the prostitute, serves as a reminder that the Lord can use us in spite of our mistakes, our infractions. Why? Let me repeat again. Because Christ who redeems through the power of the Spirit of God uses unlikely persons to proclaim the message of the cross for salvation, for the salvation of sinners allowing all believers to serve together in the kingdom of God. Now, with that, I, I want to move on to the next portion of chapter 2. So if you still have your Bibles open, I want to, I want to go there, cover that. <clears throat> Joshua chapter 2, verse 8. For the man fell asleep, she went up to the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord has given you this land, and that the terror of you has fallen on us, and everyone who lives in the land is panicking because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the river, the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did as Sahan and Og, the two Amorite kings, You completely destroyed across the Jordan. When we heard this, we lost heart, and everyone's courage failed failed because of you. For the Lord, your God, is God in heaven above and on earth below. Now please swear to me by the Lord that you will also show kindness to my father's family, because I showed kindness to you. 
Give me a sure sign that you will spare the lives of my father, mother, brothers, sisters, and all who belong to them, and save us from death. The men answered her, We will give our lives for yours. If you don't report our mission, we will show kindness and faithfulness to you when the Lord gives us the land. Then she let them down by a rope through the window, since she lived in a house that was built on the wall of the city. Go to the hill country so that the men pursuing you won't find you, she said to them. Hide there for three days until they return. Afterward, go on your way. The men said to her, we will be free from this oath you made us swear, unless when we enter the land, you tie this scarlet cord to the window through which you let us down. Bring your father, mother, brothers, and all your father's family into your house. If anyone goes out the doors of your house, his death will be, on his own fault, will be his own fault, and we will be innocent. But if anyone with you in the house should be harmed, his death will be our fault. And if you, pour, you report our mission, we are free from the oath you made us swear. Let it be as you say, she replied. And she sent them away. After, she, after they had gone, she tied the scarlet cord to the window. So the two men went into the hill country and stayed there three days until the, until the pursuers had returned. They searched all along the way, but did not find them. Then the men returned, came down from the hill country, and crossed the Jordan. They went to Joshua, son of Nun, and reported everything that had happened to them. They told Joshua, the Lord has handed over the entire land to us. Everyone who lives in the land is also panicking because of us. We read that once the members of the JPD had left the city of Jericho, Rahab went to the place where she had hidden the spies, removed the flax, and said to them, I've scratched your back and saved your lives. Now you must scratch my back and save my life and the lives of my family members. In her testimony, Rahab confessed that she and the entire city of Jericho were fearful because they'd heard the track record of the God of Israel who had been fighting for his people. They had heard all those stories, all the stories about God defeated the Amorite kings, the Amorite kings, Og and Sihon. They had heard how God had opened up the Red Sea and dried up its bottom so the children of Israel could cross on dry land. So now they were afraid. They were terrified. Their hearts melted, and they had no courage left. She, however, confessed God is not only the God of heaven, but the God of earth as well. What a, what a testimony to the sovereignty of God, isn't it? Where did this prostitute get this kind of faith? Romans 10, 17 says, Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. She believed what she heard. She believed what she heard, and not just of Israel, but about God. Rahab, the prostitute, said to the spies, show kindness to my father's family because I showed kindness to you. She requested a sign or a visible uh, pledge for the promise of sparing her family. That given, the spies told her to, if she divulged their whereabouts, then the promised protection it would be null and void. So she sent the spies on their way 
to rejoin uh, Joshua and the rest of the congregation of Israel. So again, another question, how did they get out of the city? Well, verse 5 says that the gate was shut and it was dark. How did they escape when the gate was shut? According to verse 15, Rahab let them down by a rope through a window. Similarly, when the doors are shut for us, guess what? God can open up a window. Rahab tells the spies to go to the mountain and hide there for three days until the members of the JPD returned to the city of Jericho. Then they were to resume their return to camp. After the spies left, a cord identified Rahab's residence. Now, some have suggested that its color, scarlet, reflects the blood of Jesus. The blood of Christ reflects the Passover, during which the lamb was slain and the blood was smeared on the doorpost of the Israelites' home. Lord sent an angel of death down to Egypt, and when the death angel saw the blood over the doorpost, he spared the members of the family inside those houses. Where there was no blood, no story, the firstborn son died. This scarlet cord could represent the new covenant in Jesus' blood as the wine we are to drink, that we drink during the remembrance uh, of him when we have communion together. This scarlet cord can also anticipate the marriage supper of the Lamb in fulfillment of Jesus' promise at the Last Supper. What was that promise? It's, it's in Luke chapter 22, verse 18. From now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Rahab the prostitute turns out to be an effective evangelist. In the course of a few days, she knocks on doors of her family members and urges, urges them to come to her house. She promised them that when the city of Jericho was destroyed, those individuals who were in her house with the scarlet cord hanging out the window would be saved. You know what this is also, this is also reminiscent of? Noah's Ark. Only those who came to the ark survived the flood. As I previously mentioned, Rahab is recognized in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 31, as being a believer. She was saved. In James chapter 2, verse 25, she is recognized as being justified by her works. So how can this be? Is she saved by faith as in Hebrews 11.31 or saved by works as in James 2.25? Who's right? The author of, who's right, James or the author of Hebrews? Well, I'll tell you this right now. They both are. Both are right. She was saved by faith because she believed in the God that she heard about she is justified by her works because authentic faith is followed by authentic works. Authentic faith is followed by authentic works. The order or sequence is most significant. Faith precedes works. Works succeeds. Works succeed faith. Let me repeat that. Faith precedes work, works. Works succeed faith. Salvation produces works. Works do not produce salvation. Does that make sense? We're saved by faith alone. But faith, my friends, is never alone. It's always accompanied by works. You guys familiar with the name of Charles Colson? 
he, uh, he served in Nixon's uh, administration and was involved in the whole Watergate scandal. And as a result, he was tried and convicted and sent to prison. But after he got out, he, for many years, for the, pretty much the rest of his life, he dedicated himself to prison fellowship. Well, he believed that those who need to know the love of God, those are the ones that are often overlooked or ignored because we continue to evangelize the same persons or the same people over and over again until we finally exist in order to entertain ourselves. Again, believe that those who need to know the love of God are often overlooked or ignored because we continue to evangelize the same persons over and over again until we finally exist in order to entertain ourselves. We're prone, you see, to witness to people who look like us and have the same political views as us, who are in the same social uh, classes us, economic classes us, who are in the same maybe groups as us. I'm not going to talk to those people over there in that side of the aisle. I'm not going to talk to that, you know, homosexual on the other side of a, the neck, well, actually next to my cub, next to my cubicle. I'm not going to talk to that weird person that looks all gothic and looks weird. Um, no, no, I, I, no, I'm not going to talk to them. We're so used to just talking to people that we can relate to the most. And there's nothing wrong with that. But again, we're supposed to preach the gospel to all people. Share the gospel to all people. Again, we're commanded by Christ to share the gospel with people regardless of their station in life, realizing we're called to be one diverse body, one diverse body of Christ. In verse 20, we're told Joshua in, the, oh, in chapter 6, verse 20, later on when we get there, we're told that Joshua and the Israelites marched around the city of Jericho and the walls eventually fell flat. Flat, my friends, means flat. But with one exception here. This isn't the result of an earthquake. It's the result of the power of God. What's most amazing about this reality is that Joshua chapter 6, verse 22, Joshua sends... To the two spies who had gone to Jericho to go to Rahab, the prostitute's house, and bring Rahab out, bring Rahab and all of the people who were in her house. How could this be? Joshua chapter 2, verse 15 says that her house was on the city wall and that she lived on the wall. This means that her house was part of the wall. So, if the wall fell down flat, how did her house stay intact? And how did she and the rest of her family members survive, survive it? Well, I believe, as do many other people, this is a case here, an instance of selective demolition. Because these two spies had made an oath in the name of God they made both Rahab and the residents of her house that they would be spared in order for God's name not to be repudiated. God kept his word by sparing Rahab and her family. Again, how amazing. How amazing that the entire, everything about Jericho, the entire city, the walls, everything fell. But God selectively procured that section of the wall where Rahab's house was, where it was built and didn't allow it to collapse into destruction. 
This makes me think that God has a, a way of allowing many things around us to fall. Yet he protects us in so many ways and so many times he protects us in keeping us from falling. We may not be able to explain why everything around us at times seems to fall while we're spared. It's a mystery. Here's the thing too. It's grace. It's inexplicable. We are undeserving but we must not be unappreciative. Rahab the prostitute was spared. How will she respond to such grace now that she and her family had been spared? I can't imagine Rahab starting over and establishing a brothel again. Would she have a new life? This would be this would be the unexpected response of, to grace. Surely Rahab the prostitute had a new life. Certainly Rahab the prostitute got a new way of doing that. The people in Jericho were polytheistic. They worshipped several idol gods, but Rahab the prostitute testified in Joshua in, in our verses here, verses 10 and 11, that God was the true God. See, before Rahab, the prostitute heard what God had done in the wilderness in fighting for Israel by defeating the Amorite kings who opposed them. She had heard about it. Now, Rahab, the prostitute, could see that God was doing and could see what God was doing in her own life and in her own midst. She has her own testimony that has now been experienced in a recent day. Before, her testimony was based on the things that had happened, on history. Now it's based on his story, God's story, his story. So unquestionably, Rahab underscores for Christians, for us as believers, a fuller conception of what it means to be a member of a church, of the church. Rahab wasn't Jewish. She was Gentile. Yet Hebrews 13, 11, 31, and James 2, 25 readily admit that she was now part of the family of God. So you see, the family of God consists of both Jew and Gentile. Galatians chapter 3, verse 28 affirms that. Undoubtedly, Rahab, the prostitute, symbolically represents the diversity of the end times church and also a reminder of the mixed multi multitude that came out of Egypt in the Exodus. Rahab, the prostitute, was not of the nation of Israel. However, she will forever be a part of the universal kingdom of God in which there will be people from every nation, tribe, people, and language. Rahab, the prostitute's dubious designation, disappears only when she's associated with Jesus. Let me remind you again of I said in the beginning, according to the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew chapter 1, Rahab married Salmon. They were the parents of Boaz, and Boaz is the husband of Ruth. Boaz and Ruth are the parents of Obed. Obed is the father of Jesse. Jesse is the father of David. And out of David, eventually, comes Jesus. Friends, a former prostitute is honored to be one of the greatest grandmothers of Jesus. It didn't matter who she was, what mattered, what was important, what really mattered was her faith. So I want to begin closing with that just to remind you, it doesn't matter who you were, 
It doesn't matter what you did. It matters now who you are in Christ. He doesn't see you. God doesn't see you as that person of old. That person that hurt so many people. That person that hurt, like, has, had been hurt by all kinds of people. He doesn't see you as an, a murderer, as a thief, as an adulterer. You've been covered by the blood of Jesus, and he sees you now as redeemed, forgiven, sanctified. You're not that person anymore. So don't live with the guilt of who that person was. It's not you anymore. You're a child of God. Celebrate. Celebrate that. Jesus died to suffer on the cross so that you could. So that you could celebrate and praise God for who you are now. Well, I want to speak to those who you, you do are given, you have been given a designation. People know you as oh, so and so the adulterer, so and so the thief, so and so the convict. Well, next to Christ, you're now his child. So if you want to be forgiven, if you want now to have a new, new designation, you want to have a new life, I want to invite you to the cross. Bear your sins before Jesus and ask him to forgive you of your sins, and he will. No matter how bad those sins were. He will forgive you if you pray sincerely for him to do so. Now, if you've never prayed in your life, if you're not familiar with prayer, it's been a long time since you've prayed. I, I can lead you in a prayer to do that. So wherever you're at, you to close your eyes and bow your head with all your heart as if you were let me, let me, let me go back like if you're talking to him personally right now pray this Lord Jesus I know that I'm a sinner and I ask that you forgive me. I now believe and confess you are Lord and believe that you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I repent of all that I've done, all my awful deeds, all my sins that separated me from you. And I now confess you as my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. I now ask you to fill me with the Holy Spirit so that he may help guide me and teach me, show me, right way to live, to be obedient to you. I pray this in your name. Amen. Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope we were blessed by Pastor Angel's message. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvccelp.com. If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. 
Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.